Cool. All right. So first things first, uh, we're talking about um, buyers' offers in this type of market. So I'm guessing you're all here or, or watching us live uh, because every single offer that you submit is getting accepted. Right? Is that happening right now? Every single one? Every time? Okay, no, not quite? Okay, so you're going through the same things we're going through. So um, what, what today is going to talk about is kind of two things. Number one, preparing your buyers for what's happening in the market. So I'll touch a little bit on that. And then, kind of like I mentioned, I'm going to show, I'm going to give you a thought and or I'm going to show you how it's presented to a client and then I'll stop it and say, Here's the logic behind that, or vice versa. I may share the logic and say, here's what it looks like when you're presenting it to a client. So first things first, a couple things I'm gonna open with. Obviously, the one thing that really doesn't um, apply to getting buyer's offers accepted, but I think it's important that you guys are all paying attention to it, and that is the value of a listing today has changed, okay? And what I mean by that is there was a day where you would take a listing and Every time you took a listing, you knew that you would have three sales because of that listing. And our rule of thumb was always the listing sells. They're going to be buying from you. And if they don't buy from you, hopefully you'll get a couple sales from it. Or they'll buy from you and you'll get one sale from that listing. Because someone calls on, off of Zillow or Realtor.com or from the sign or whatever. The days of taking a listing and getting three sales from it are done. And that's because there's, a, there's an upside and a downside to that. The downside is, is that now those leads that you would get, that you would normally be able to sell your listing or go sell other homes, are now being sold to other agents. Okay, That's the downside. The upside is, if you're an agent that doesn't necessarily have a lot of listings, or um, don't have the skills to take a lot of listings, or are newer and listings just aren't your thing, you have the opportunity to work buyer leads, or purchase buyer leads, which you would have never had the ability to do before. So it's kind of like a catch-22. On one hand, if you don't take a lot of listings, it's great this way because now you can buy purchase leads or whatever and, and get more leads even without listings. Where before, in order to get buyer leads, you had to have listings. So that's why one of the things that you're seeing in the market today, the, the intensity of the follow-up to buyer leads is higher than it's ever been. And the reason for that is because, again, before you have the listing, you control the lead. Now the lead's being sold, and it's not just being sold to one person, it's being sold to multiple agents, and buyers now are less loyal because when the market is tough like it is, they start looking for all different ways to find out about listings, which means even though they're working with you, they're visiting open houses, they're doing searches on their own, they might be knocking on doors. I mean, you guys have probably, if you're out in the field, I'm hearing this more and more from agents, so I had a, bu I had a buyer stop me after I was done showing a house and, and ask if... I would work with them or if I could show them the house, right? Buyers are going to extreme measures to get into listings right now and it all revolves around the fact that the value of having listings is changing. Because the list, the, the inventory is so scarce and because the buyer leads are so um, sought after, we're in a situation where we have multiple offers and that's what's driving prices up and driving agents like yourself and myself crazy because we're having great offers not get accepted. And so what I want to talk about today is um, how we can get more of those offers accepted. And a lot of it isn't just that, hey, do this and your offer will be accepted. A lot of it is in the setup. And believe it or not, people are surprised to hear this one. I tell them I still sell 30 to 40 buyer transactions a year myself personally. Now I don't show any homes. I, work, I use showing agents to show the properties. But I still do the buyer consultations, I still do the offer consultations, I still present the offer to the agent and discuss why their offer is stronger and why the agent should accept ours and so forth. Uh, so these, this is all real stuff. This isn't like something I did five years ago or ten years ago. This is stuff I'm doing today. So I want to make sure, if you don't already, you have to have a process for these two things. Number one, what is your buyer consultation process? Okay, and this isn't something we're going to discuss in too much detail today because we're talking about getting offers accepted. But it starts with a really strong buyer consultation. What is your buyer consultation process? <laughs> and oh, by the way, what I do in this video here is done at the buyer consultation. So I want you to picture yourself when you're watching this and when I'm stopping it and pausing it and making comments and so forth, this being part of your buyer consultation. 
because guess what happens if you don't make this part of your buyer consultation, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because we've all done it, including myself, you get to a point where you're ready to make a recommendation of what they need to do to make their offer stand out, and they don't want to do it. They don't take your advice. And guess what? Their offer doesn't get accepted. And because you're a great professional, you don't say things like I told you so, but you know deep down you want to do that, and, and you want to kick them and, and say, what the heck? Uh, listen to me next time. Now, you, this proves you got to listen. Right? You don't say things like that. But if you have this conversation in the buyer consultation, you're going to show less homes and get more offers accepted just by doing this in the buyer consultation because they're going to be more likely to take your advice versus waiting until it's time to write an offer. Now, when it comes time to write an offer, the second thing you need to have down pat is your offer consultation process. What is your offer consultation process? Well, well what is that? Well, I, I mean, I just ask them, you know, what do they want to offer? I make a recommendation and that's that. No, no, no. Okay? What is your process for having a dialogue with this with them? What is your process for calling agents? You know, the best question you can call and ask a listing agent, the number one question we ask every time is this. Besides price, what is the most important factor to your seller in selecting an offer? Besides price, this is a conversation I'm having with the listing agent. Besides price, what is the most important factor to your seller in selecting an offer? And you're going to get one of two answers. You're either going to get the answer of what the listing agent wants in an offer. Okay, they're deciding good, bad, right, or wrong. A lot of times they decide for them. Well, we want a buyer that's going to pay over price value. Or you'll get what the seller truly wants. And they'll say, you know, honestly, my sellers are buying a, or building a home. It's not going to be ready until July. We would like to work with a buyer that's willing to let them stay in the home until July. Great, I'm making a note of that, and since I know that is the, the seller's hot button, if you will, I'm not only letting them stay there until July, I'm giving them until July 15th, and I'm letting them stay there for free, right? I know that's their hot button. I ask their agent, what's most important besides price? If you don't say besides price, most agents are just gonna say price. Well, we're gonna look at the price in terms. We're gonna look at the price in terms of all. Okay, I get you're gonna look at the price in terms of all of them, and I appreciate that. Besides price in terms, What's the number one thing your seller is looking for in accepting an offer? And you'd be surprised at things that they tell you, right? You'd be surprised at what they'll reveal to you based on the amount of traffic and so forth. And you can ask those questions. Are you getting a lot of activity? Do you have any offers? I will tell you, as a side note, we were just talking about it in the top five mastermind. After this class or sometime when you're bored and have 20 minutes to spare, I want you to Google uh, Michigan Realtors Letter of the Law Multiple Offer Situations. Michigan Realtors Letter of the Law, Multiple Offer Situations. What you'll discover when you watch that video, and Brent, we played it for our people, that you're going to learn a lot. And you're not going to let these listing agents bully you anymore because they think they got it all figured out. I know I'm one of them. I can sometimes be a bully. No, I'm kidding. Okay? Because when you watch this video, you'll know what they legally can and can't say. And you'd be surprised at the things that they can and can't say. And so, um, don't be bullied anymore. Know the law. I've never been like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, obviously I've gone through all the classes and so forth. But that video, you'll learn a lot, especially in the market that we're in right now. So, what is your system for buyer consultations? What is your system for offer consultations? During your buyer consultation, your offer consultation, you should put together what I like to call a buying power checklist. And this is how you are going to educate your customer on their buying power. And you'll let them know whether they have a high level of buying power or a low level of buying power. And you'll see that when we go through the video. And again, trust me when I tell you, I, I love speaking and training and presenting. But what I think is, is great about this, even though I, I, when I did this in Plymouth, I told them, like, don't think I'm lazy just because I'm playing this video. I'm doing it because I want you to see how I actually present it to a client. So you're going to get the best of both worlds. You're going to get my explanation of why. I present it this way, and then you're actually going to see how it's presented to a client. Now, this isn't an actual client. This is Kelly Knatzer. She's one of our agents, uh, and we're in our Plymouth office, so I'm not sitting at you know a kitchen table or anything. By the way, if you're not going to be able to, just a little side note, if you can't do a buyer consultation at the office, do it at their house. You'll get a lot more listings by doing it at their house than at the office or a Starbucks. Do it at their home that they own. Now, if it's an apartment, fine. You can still do it there. You're probably not going to get a listing. Unless the developer of the apartment wants to sell the building, maybe. <laughs> While you're there, stop in the office, see if they're interested. No, I don't know. 
Um, so no, buyer consultation at their home, you can easily transition into the market value of their home. And you better have a market analysis prepared and ready to go. So again, I'm going to start and stop this a lot because I'm going to add commentary. I'm going to say, okay, and there's things I even screwed up where I'm like, oh, I should have said this in this situation. And I'll, I'll correct myself. And I've also gotten some things that I've learned, fortunately for you guys, because we've already done this once in Plymouth, they gave me some crazy things that they've seen, seen in offers that I'll share with you guys today. So you are the beneficiary of that. So let me press play on this and make sure we've got, and again, it's going to be a lot of stopping and starting, but I want to test the audio, make sure we're good there. And you guys tell me if it's too quiet or too loud. The buying power checklist, as well as the conversation to lead up to the buying power checklist. So Kelly, uh, are you familiar with what's taking place in the market today? Uh, no, not really. I'm sure you're seeing things move pretty quickly. Um, you've probably heard things about um, home prices going up and a lot of activity in the market. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Do you know anyone that's bought or sold recently? Um, not really. Okay. Um, and how long have you been looking for a home? Um, for about two months. Two months, okay. And have you noticed anything while you've been searching? Uh, just that the homes keep selling before we can even look at them sometimes. Yeah, they're moving pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And do you know why that is? Uh, I guess there's just a lot of buyers maybe and not enough homes. Yeah, yeah, there's actually a couple things happening right now. So um, we, we have what's considered a lack of inventory and what the experts are calling a seller's market. Are you familiar with the difference between a seller's and a buyer's market? Uh, okay. Not really. So okay. I'm going to stop it there for a second because before I even get into this discussion, <clears throat> I'm asking, tell me what you know about what's going on in the market. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to hear if they've had anyone that they're, they know that's close to them buy or sell a home recently and they have some experiences. You don't want to bore someone with a ton of this if they have experience. Now, obviously for the sake, I knew this was being videotaped, right? So I get in a lot into detail. If they've had a lot of experience or they say, listen, we were working with another agent and, and yeah, we've had experience with this or so-and-so just bought and they lost out on a bunch of properties, you want to judge based on how elementary you get, if you will, in the presentation, based on what they tell you in that, in that type of scenario. So I always start out with kind of a Q&A to kind of gauge where they're at. And I do that in every single buyer consultation. Okay. Well, in a buyer's market, the market is generally, they say buyer's market because it's in favor of buyers. You have a lot of homes to choose from. Um, generally speaking, sellers have to reduce their price Usually you can get the home for under asking price and in the end you ultimately end up with a pretty good deal on a house in a buyer's market. And a buyer's market comes and goes generally every five to seven years, depending on what's taking place in the economy, depending on inventory levels and so forth. Okay. Uh, right now we're in a seller's market. So the upside to you is that because we're coming out of, as you know, 2008, 9, 10, 11 was a little bit of a depression, recession it was called. Um, they had to lower interest rates in order to get the market moving. And so since they lowered interest rates, what took place was home values started going up because more buyers said, oh, wow, that's a great deal, I, I, you know, 4%. Now, as you're watching this, you may see, you may be thinking this is super elementary and I know this stuff, but the reason why I start off this way, and you'll see I even do like kind of a little elementary basic chart of what's going on in the market. So that way, I have a better chance of convincing Kelly of what we need to do to get the offer accepted because she is fully educated on why she is paying over asking. See, I think what happens in a lot of cases, we expect our buyers to pay over asking because that's the market we're in and because that's what everyone's doing. But I think you'll have an easier, I don't think I know you'll have an easier time getting them to accept that logic when they understand why they're being asked to do these things. Because until meeting you, their parents or their friends or their nephews or nieces or whatever told them, oh no, you need to offer 95% of asking price, ask them for concessions, you know, right? They're, they haven't had an education on what's going on in the market. So I don't want you to spend a half hour boring them with details on what took place in the market, but at, at least a few minutes of your conversation should be, are you familiar with what's taking place in the market today? And lead them up until to what I'm doing right here. Yeah, that's amazing. Let's do it. So buyers got out there, started buying homes, they had a house to sell, they sold their house, went and bought another, created a lot of activity in the market. And that's what actually drove the prices up. 
to the prices that they're at today. Now, the good news is, is that you're still getting in at a good time in terms of an interest rate. So, because um, buyers say all the time, well, if I'm buying at the top of the market, shouldn't I just wait? Well, it doesn't necessarily make sense to wait unless you're paying cash. Um, and, and even still, we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know what the market's going to do, even if you're paying cash. And the reason for that is because even if prices do drop, let's say 10% over the next year or two years, it's important. Okay, 10% on a $200,000 house is $20,000 that you would say, right? Because uh, buyers sell the time, uh, shouldn't we wait until there's more inventory? Now, the, the reason why we don't generally recommend that somebody wait until prices come down and wait until it's a buyer's market is because when a market is hot, generally speaking, the feds will raise the interest rates, which, which means happens. that it'll cost you more to, let, to borrow money. Right now, the rates are about 4.5%. This was last year. Uh, 10 years ago, they were 6%. So it's not like they go up a lot. I mean, if they go up, they might go up a point or a point and a half. But if you think about it, going from 4.5% to, say, 5.5% increase in an interest rate is about a 20% interest increase in your cost. Right, so if you go from four and a half to five and a half, even though it's one percent, that's going from four and a half to five five and a half is actually a twenty percent increase. So what that means is, even though the home may be worth ten percent less because it's buyer's market, if you're paying twenty percent more, in the end, you still actually end up paying more for the house over the life of the thirty year loan. Okay, that makes sense. So that's why when we get the question, well, should I wait because inventory level is low? Well, you can wait and probably get a house for a better price, but you're going to pay more for it in the long run because of the interest rate increase that typically takes place. And again, I don't have a crystal ball, so I. So this was this was last summer when I recorded this. So, of course, the interest rates have gone up. So what I was predicting in this particular scenario, if she waited a year, she's paying probably five percent today, or four and three quarters, or five and a quarter, or whatever. And she actually, even though the prices pretty much remain unchanged or maybe went up a little bit, she's actually out a significant amount of money by waiting until this year. That exact same scenario could happen next year, even if more homes come on the market and prices come down slightly. If interest rates go back to 6%, which it's not out of the question, they've been at 6%, you know, 2003, three, four, they were around 6% in those years. Um, you saw the increase, the 1% the increase or one and a half percent increase could be a 20 or 20 percent increase on the cost of your mortgage, which is significantly more than 10 percent you might save in a home's value. So if, if it's not coming up, I would recommend that you address that ahead of time because you better believe they're already thinking it. If they're hearing from people, inventory's tight, listings are scarce, they're already thinking maybe we should wait. So instead of waiting until they bring it up, you should bring it up as part of your buyer consultation. What if they're What's that? What if they're cash? If, ca if they're cash, it doesn't matter. Exactly what the interest rates will go up to, or if they'll even go up. But this is just based on history, what we've seen over the last several years. And if you haven't been paying attention to the market, I kind of just drew out before you got here, just kind of a quick um, graph. And of course, it's rough sketch. It's just <laughs> a yellow graph. I literally ago. wrote And it kind of showed you, down, starting back up. in 2000, what took place in the market. In the year 2000, Prices went steadily up for a good five years or so. In fact, if I went back to 95, you'd see the same thing. From 1995 to 2005, they had a nice steady increase of about 3 to 5% per year, which is normal. And then we got to about the peak, which is the end of 2005 to the beginning of 2006. And all of a sudden, economy changed, jobs changed, um, you know, we went through presidency changes over those years. A lot of things took place, and that caused us to go into that great recession. So everything we gained from, 2000, from 1995 to 2005, we lost in five years. So what, what took us 10 years to gain, we lost in five. And 2010 was our true bottom of the market, meaning uh, since 2010, our prices have been steadily going up. In fact, from 2010 to 2015, we gained almost all of it back because the inventory levels were so low and the interest rates were so low. So we, here we are today, still on a pretty steady climb and in a strong market, and that's why with the inventory levels as low as they are, we're getting our, our, most of the buyers out there in the market are getting into multiple offer situations. And that goes back to the inventory levels. To give you an idea, at the bottom here, we had over 100,000 homes for sale in Southeast Michigan. Okay. Today, we have 15,000. Oh, wow. So, and, and the buyer activity is still pretty strong. So if you think about it, 
there's less homes to choose from, guess what? If you're looking at a great house, somebody else is probably looking at it too, right? If you're looking so at a great house, together, chances are somebody else is looking at it too. Checklist. And the buying power checklist is armed with information to give you a leg up, to give you advantage on the competition. Your competition, good, bad, right, or wrong, is other buyers. And so there are certain things that our buyers are having to do to get their offer to stand out. Now, when you hear some of these things, you'll think, well, gosh, it sounds like this is really in favor of the sellers. Well, that's unfortunately because it is, because it's a seller's market. And again, I go back to, well, why am I buying right now? Well, you're buying right now because it's still cheap to buy, right? The money is only 4.5% or it could be 5.5% or 6% like we saw 10 years ago, which means you actually end up paying more in the long run. So I'm going to go through this list with you and just explain what each one of these is. Just, I mean, I'm not going to bore you to death with all the details. I'm going to touch on each one just so that way when we get to a point to where you say, Jeff, I love this house on Banana Street. I have to have it. You'll know exactly what you can do to arm yourself to put you in first position or at least in the top three contenders for that property. Okay. A lot of the properties right now have three, four, five, sometimes ten offers. And so most of these agents, what they're doing is they're just telling their, their buyer to write up their best offer and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. This is arming you with some things that the competition doesn't know or isn't doing in their offers. Fair enough? Okay. I'll walk you through it now. Okay, so I think one thing I did right there. Yeah. Black Cadillac has to be moved to fleet here. Okay. Oh, the space bar will do that too? Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so one thing, if you didn't catch it, it's important that you write this down. If you did, good for you. Um, you. The buyers today think during the buyer consultation that we're working for the seller. You go through all this stuff with them and you give them dialogue of what's going on in the market and it sounds like, and by, by the way, they might not say it to you. I've actually had some say it to me. That's why I set this up this way. It sounds really like you're working for the seller. If they don't say that to you, they're thinking that because you're you're basically giving them everything they need to do to make their offer more appealing to not them, the seller. So since we know that you're going to be sharing this information with them, you better start and finish, which you'll see I do this here and I do it in every buyer consultation. Now, Mr. Mr. Buyer, it's going to sound a lot like I'm working for the seller. You have to know I'm arming you with the tools you need to beat out your competition. Your competition is other buyers. So when you arm them with that, with those tools, and you let them know the reason is not because you're working for the seller, the reason is to help them beat out their competition, it'll remove that thought from their head. Because you better believe they're already thinking that in their head when you start giving them things that they can do. All right? Base mark, let's try it. Okay, and these are in no particular order, by the way. So, you know, you may do a few of these on your offer, you may do one of them, you may do all of them, you know, depending on how bad you want the house. Okay. And just so you know, I'll always have a conversation with the listing agent to get as much information as I can about the seller and what's important to them. So that way we can tailor the buying power checklist to what the seller is looking for. Great. Fair enough? So one of the things that you can do in this market right now is offer free options. Free occupancy is Offering basically free when you stay, I'm sorry, when you allow the seller to stay in the home after closing. It's basically like they're renting the house back from you, but at no charge. Now, the reason why this is attractive to a seller is because generally speaking, a seller, when they sell their home, they now need to go shop for another house. So because that process takes time, as we talked about earlier, I went through that timing analysis with you, because it takes time, they may need to stay in their home a little bit longer after closing. So sometimes it's a couple weeks, sometimes it's a couple months. Generally speaking, it's around 30 days. And so the reason why free occupancy is attractive, number one, because you're giving them time so they're not rushed, that's good. And then you're not charging them for it, which makes it more attractive. Okay. The cost to you, this is assuming important. you're shopping around two and 250,000. Make sure they understand really the cost good. of free occupancy. The cost to you really is nothing out of pocket because your mortgage payment doesn't start for a month after you close. But the cost to you, if you go back and calculate it, it truly did cost you a month's rent for a month's payment, which would be about $1,500 at that price range, plus or minus a little bit. So yes, it's still a $1,500 expense, but it's a big offering to the seller and could be something that causes them to take your offer over another one. Okay. Make sense? Perfect. Great. The next one I'm... So instead of offering $10,000 over asking, or maybe you do both, free occupancy 
for a month is only a 12 or 13, you know, this is on a $200,000 house, she told me was her price range. Free occupancy is only a $1,500 expense. And not only that, it's not even really a true expense because your payment doesn't start for, you know, if you close on May 15th, your first payment isn't until July the 1st. So it's not like you're making double payments by giving them free occupancy. Now, in the end, if you do the math, does it end up costing the buyer? Of course it does. But $1,500 to offer someone uh, peace of mind that they don't have to move out ahead of closing, if they're building a house or whatever, if the other buyers are offering occupancy and you're the one that's offering free occupancy, then your offer is going to stand out. But what I want to make sure everyone did there is understand that the free occupancy doesn't cost you a lot of money. And, and that's important that you make sure the buyer understands that. And here is, in, in depending on the particular city that you're shopping in, is you are willing to assume the city inspection. Some cities require that the seller provide a certificate of occupancy in order to sell the house. In this particular case, if you find a home in a city that requires it, you may say to the seller, you know what, I'll take that on. I love the house. I see that it needs a little bit of work. Yeah, the, electric, the electrical needs to be updated. I'll take that on. Um, that is an option that you have, and that would cause your offer to stand out over another buyer's potential offer. Okay. It's less headaches for the seller. Right. Next, you could offer extended occupancy. So we talked about offering free occupancy. Mm -hmm. Extended occupancy would be a number that's above and beyond the norm. So I said the norm is about 30 days. Sometimes the seller only needs two weeks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the seller's building a house and needs two or three months. Mm -hmm. There's not many buyers out there that would be willing to wait to get into a home. Now this goes back to the timing analysis. If you had the time, give it to them because okay. it's going to make your offer stand out. Okay. Fair enough. By the way, the timing analysis I'm referring to, and you should do this with every buyer during your off, during your buyer consultation, is basically if we take you out and start showing you homes today, the timeline of how long it takes to get an offer accepted and negotiated, the timeline of how long it takes to close, make sure you build the occupancy right in there so they know in advance that you're going to be probably suggesting that they offer occupancy and when they'd actually get their keys. A lot of buyers think if they start looking at homes this weekend, they're gonna have keys by like June 1st. That's not the case. And it's important that you take them through just a simple, again, it can be on a yellow pad, whatever, just kind of, I call it the timing analysis. Um, if you're an FHA borrower, then you could, when you put together the FHA addendum, there's a document we use called an FHA addendum. And on the FHA addendum, it states that the seller will pay up to blank amount of any repairs. Okay. See, an FHA appraisal, generally, they go through a house and they may have one or two things that they, that they want done in order to lend money on that house. Well, it's negotiable who does those repairs. Sometimes, buyers will ask a seller, we want you to take on those repairs. Okay? If you do that, chances of your offer getting accepted in this market are very slim. Okay. So you would actually put in the addendum that says the buyer the seller is responsible for up to zero dollars of those repairs, okay. causing your offer to stand out and making it more attractive if you're FHA. Okay. Makes sense? Now the downside is you're responsible for those repairs and, and sometimes you have to get them done before closing or we can set aside money in escrow to get them done. But again, if that's what it takes to get the house, you may have to do that. Okay. Makes sense? Another real common one right now is paying over a price value. Paying over appraised value, of course, is never fun because an appraiser comes in and says, I know you agreed to buy it for 200000 The home is only worth one eighty. Um, you know, what do you want to do, basically? And so you have a couple options there. Of course, uh, you have the option, if we did not agree to pay over the appraised value, it's already pre-written into the purchase agreements to declare the offer no one void. Okay, now, most buyers don't want to do that because there's a line of other people that want to buy that house if your deal falls through. So what we try to do is we try to get the seller to reduce a little bit, kind of meet in the middle. So if it appraises at 180 and sell for uh, 200, okay, let's see if the seller can come down to 190. The downside is, is that you're paying $10,000 more than the home appraised for. Okay. But you're still getting it for $10,000 less than what, it actually, what you actually agreed to buy it at. Now that's something that we can put into the purchase agreement up front to make the seller feel more comfortable. So what I did there is I pre-sold the buyer on how they're still at an advantage by paying over appraised value. Okay, if you notice that, yes, they're paying over 10, you know, 10K over appraised value, but you're still saving 10K overall on the house. So I'm pre-selling the buyer on this potentially happening and how 
even though you're paying over price value, it's still a lot in the long run a benefit to you. That, that's very important. So they know when they're staring at that purchase agreement, wow, this buyer's willing to give me ten thousand dollars over price value. That's strong. Mm -hmm. Now we always put a clause in there that says it cannot exceed the sales price. So if you agree to buy it at two hundred and it appraises at one ninety five, you don't have to buy it at two hundred five. Okay. It's got okay. Sorry. Two hundred. Okay. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that extra 10K is out of pocket though, and that is something that buyers are doing right now to make their offer stand out. Okay. And if you have the money to do it, I would recommend it. Okay. Now, uh, you were planning on putting about 10% down on your loan, is that right? Yeah. So one thing I will mention to you, since you already are aware of PMI, right? Academy explained to you about PMI. Yeah. So PMI in your price range is probably 150 or $200 a month. You're already paying the PMI. So one thing that we're seeing buyers do in your particular situation is go from putting 10% down on their loan to 5% down and 5% of 200,000 is what 10 grand there you go so you could put 5% down on your loan and agree to pay up to $10,000 over price value and you're really not any more out of pocket than you had already planned on okay does that make sense and the PMI doesn't go up that much between 10% down and 5% down okay. I mean we're talking maybe 10 or 15 bucks a month okay so now of course you would want to have them have that discussion with the lender, okay? Um, but it's it's if they're already in the position to where they're paying PMI, okay, they were doing three percent down or five percent down or ten percent down. Why don't we adjust the amount? Why don't we reduce the amount that you're putting down? Instead of putting ten thousand dollars down on the loan, why don't we see if your lender will allow seventy five hundred down? And then we can take that other twenty five hundred since it was kind of already out of sight, out of mind and offer to pay that $2,500 over appraised value. So it's not actually costing them any more out of pocket. They are already planning on putting 10% down. Why don't we reduce it by five, go down to five. You're gonna have PMI anyways. Does the PMI rate and all that stuff change? Absolutely, they're gonna pay more in PMI because they're going from 10% down to 5% down. But it's not a significant increase, in, if, if, if any increase out of pocket because they were already mentally prepared for 10% down. So instead of putting 10% down, they put 5% down, they pay a little bit more monthly, but they're now able to pay $10,000 over appraised value, not pull any money out of pocket, any, any more money out of pocket than they were already planning on, and they get their house accepted, they get their offer accepted. So whenever you have a buyer that's kind of already accepted in their mind that they're gonna pay PMI, they're putting 5% down, see if they can qualify for 3%. Take that other 2%, offer to pay that over appraised value. They're putting 10% down, put 5% down. Take the other 5% and pay it over appraised value. They're, and yes, you have to put the disclaimer out there, you're gonna pay more in PMI, and that's something their lender will tell them. And it's important probably to have a conversation with the lender before they meet with them and say, hey, this is the discussion we had. Could they qualify for 5% down instead of 10% down? Because I think this is what's gonna be required to get their offer accceptance. As a listing agent, 3%, 5%, 10%, as long as it's conventional, right? Uh, you know, obviously a 20% is going to stand out, so it might not be the best advice for someone putting 20% down, but I'll tell you, somebody that's putting 20% down, chances are they have another couple extra thousand laying around, right? They can put a couple points towards it. But if you got a 10% downer, take them down to a 5 and take that other 5%, pay over price value. Got it? That could be one thing you could do to cause your offer to stand out, and it's very common right now. Another option you have is to waive the appraisal altogether. Now, this would be if you absolutely had to have a house and uh, money was no object. Because when you waive the appraisal altogether, you're basically telling the seller, look, I'll, I'll pay 200 even if your price is 150, I don't care. Okay. And the challenge with that is there's no cap to it. So you could be stuck paying 5,000 or 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, again, depends on how bad you want a house. I'll bring it up to you at the time of offer. If you want to do that, you can. I recommend at least putting a cap. Okay. I'll tell you, at the $200,000 price level, generally, the cap is around 5%, okay. which would be 10 grand. Okay. Sometimes we see 15, but usually it's 5 to 10 grand at your price point. Make sense? Mm -hmm. One of the nice things that you can do to cause your offer to stand out is make sure it's not contingent on sale or close of your home. Okay? okay? Um, you know, sale is deadly. Contingent on sale means that your, your home still has to sell. You haven't even found a buyer for the home that you're selling. At least contingent on closing is a little bit better because you're saying, look, here, we have a purchase agreement in hand. Just give us an opportunity to close this. And then once our listing gets closed, 
we'll remove that contingency and move forward. Okay. All things being equal, though, if you're looking at three offers and one has one other chance of not making it to the closing table, which one are you probably not going to select? Right. The one that has less of a chance of getting to the closing table. So we recommend. So two things I do there. Number one, you'll notice it throughout the whole thing. I'm trying to put the buyer in the seller's shoes as much as possible, right? Especially if they have a home to sell, because we can say, hey, here's the good news. When we're on the other end, we're you know we can look at this too. The other thing I brought up is the contingency on sale versus contingency on close. This is a perfect segue into, so if you're really serious about doing this this year or this spring or whatever, we need to get your home on the market like tomorrow because nobody's gonna take you seriously until you at least have an offer on your house. So it'd be the perfect segue into that conversation. Recommend whenever possible, and of course you'd have to check with your lender to make sure you qualify to not put a contingency on sale or close. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. The other thing that's taking place right now is it's kind of commonplace in the market, uh, or it has been for years, that the earnest money deposit, basically your good faith deposit, is 1%. It's been like that for years and years. Well, when I first started in business 14 years ago, it was actually 3% as common. Somehow it went down to one, I'm not sure. So when you when you go put an offer on a house at 200,000, prior to this hot seller's market, a couple thousand dollars good faith deposit was normal. Now we're seeing good faith deposits of 5,000, 10,000. So I would recommend at least a 3% earnest money deposit. And that is the check that you write to show that your offer is good for more than the paper it's written on. Okay. If for whatever reason you have a bad inspection or your financing falls through, you get that check back. The only way you'd actually lose that money is if you defaulted, meaning you just tell the seller you change your mind and, and you're going in another direction. Okay. You would lose it at that point. But you still have the contingency on inspection, and if your financing falls through, you have a contingency on financing, you would get that back. So if you increase the earnest money deposit a little bit, could you see how the seller would be feel would feel a little bit better about your offer and the strength of it? Yeah. And that's what this is all about, the strength okay. of the offer. <laughs> so the earnest money deposit, you'd be surprised, especially those who work with a lot of sellers, how many sellers are like, oh wow, they have a ten thousand earnest money deposit. That's that's good. Where we know it's very rare that if a deal falls through, the seller will ever end up getting that $10,000. I mean, I've done hundreds and been involved in thousands of transactions, and maybe once or twice the seller has actually gotten their hands on the EMD. So as a buyer, know that your chances of getting it back are pretty high if something falls through. And it's, if it's going to be a big deal to the seller, especially your traditional sellers, that have, you know, it's been a while since they've bought or sold a home, they're gonna value, your baby boomers, right, Brent? Yeah. They're, gonna, they're gonna value a higher EMD. They know of it, by the way, as a good faith deposit. That's what it was called 20 years ago, Brent, you remember that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and if you date me. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, it was attractive to them. So now, hey, I'm doing a two or a 3% EMD as much as I can. I mean, think about it. If they're putting 10% down, let's do a 5% EMD, why not? Okay, the offer gets accepted, it's going towards the same stuff anyways, and you get it back if it doesn't. Full lender approval, not just pre-approval. I know you've already spoken to Academy, and that's good, and I appreciate that you've got a pre-approval. Um, a full lender approval means picking up the phone to Academy and saying, hey, we really want this house. Can you get my stuff, as much stuff as you can, to get me a document that says conditionally approved? Okay. And that means... You know, there's a few stipulations left over, but it's a stronger approval. It's a conditional approval versus the pre-approval. Okay. Pre-approval is just ch asking you what you make, maybe checking your credit score, you know, asking you a few questions about how much money you have to make. Anyone can produce a pre-approval. But if you're a seller and I'm a seller's agent and you hand me a document that says conditionally approved and then I can see the conditions on there, meaning what you need to provide in order to get the full approval, I'm going to feel more comfortable with that than an actual pre-approval. And I can help you with that, and of course that's something you want to talk to a client about. Make sense? Great. Another thing that buyers are doing right now, again, I don't necessarily recommend it. It's one of those things that you absolutely have to have a house, and that is a non-refundable earnest money deposit, which basically says, I saw your house, I don't care what the inspection says, I don't care what the appraisal says, if I don't close, you get to keep that $5,000 or that $6,000, that 3% we just talked about. That's what's called a non-refundable earnest money deposit. Generally, I don't recommend it. It's only one of those things if you absolutely had to have the house and money was no option. 
<laughs> but it's my job as your agent to let you know that that's an option. So that way, if there's a case where you do lose out on a home and I call you, and, and hopefully this isn't the case, and I have to say, hey, Kelly, you're not going to believe it. We had a great offer, but we lost out to another buyer because they were willing to waive their earnest money deposit and make it non refundable. I don't want you to say, well, Jeff, why didn't you tell me about that option? I don't recommend it, okay. uh, but it is an option. Okay? Uh, now, waiving the earnest money, and quite frankly, on any of these recommendations, if any of these recommendations you just don't feel like they're going to be comfortable with, or you don't think is really the best thing for them, or you think they're going to just you know, lose rapport or whatever, I'm telling you this so that way, hopefully this isn't the case, if we get the call that we lost out to another buyer, and I tell you it's because, in this particular case, they, they waived their EMD, meaning they said you can have our EMD no matter what happens, whether we close or not, or they offered to pay over appraised value, or they gave a $10,000 EMD, it's my job to let you know all this stuff up front, so that way, if that happens, you're not saying to me, Jeff, why didn't you tell me about that option? So I'll say, disclaimer or disclosure, I don't recommend waiving your EMD, but it's important that you know that this is an option and this is something buyers are doing to get their offers accepted. So if by chance, stepping out of the role play, if by chance you have to make that call and say, hey, we didn't get it, you're not going to believe this, the buyer said they're waiving their EMD no matter what, you're not yelling at me for not telling you about that being an option. Actually, having your more money down on loan than typical for the price range. Now, this is hard to control if you're shopping at 200000 and you're only planning on putting 5 or 10% down. That would apply to a buyer if they were already putting 20 and they had a lot of money, a lot of money in the bank above and beyond the 20. I might encourage them to put 30% down or 40% down if they have it to just make their offer stand out. Keep in mind the seller is looking for two things: money and odds of closing. So more money down means a higher amount of closing. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Great. And by the way, I, I just had this discussion with this, with a buyer today. Here's how it comes up. Every now and then you'll have a buyer that is, you know, they've got 20%. And they'll say to you, well, we were planning on doing at least 20. Well, when you say at least 20, I mean, is that you know, 25, 30? Well, probably somewhere between 30 and 40. Okay, would it be okay if we committed on the offer to 30%? Well, why, why are you having me commit to that? Well, the reason is, is because if they have five offers and the one that they want to choose that's competing with ours has 20% down and we're at 30% down, that's another reason to choose ours. So if you're even remotely thinking at all about putting 30% down, then I say we commit to it now. It's going to increase your chance of getting your offer accepted. So, and again, when they say things like, well, we're probably putting somewhere between 20, 25, 30, don't just instantly go to, all right, I'll put a minimum of 20 because you can always increase your down payment. Actually get them to commit to 5% more or 10% more. If they have the money to do so, put it on the purchase agreement. It'll make their offer stand out. Next I have on here, appraisal first at the same time as inspection. Now, this is um, not as risky. In fact, I like this one because the only thing that, that the only risk on your part is that if you do the appraisal and the inspection and you have them set up at the same time and say the first week, it's attractive to the seller because they can get everything figured out within a week to 10 days. The downside to you as a buyer is you're going to have to outlay cash for a home inspection and an appraisal at the same time. And the reason why I'm explaining it to you that way is because usually one is done before the other. So you spend $400 on a home inspection everything checks out fine, now you spend another $400 on the appraisal and you move forward. Okay. In this particular case, to get your offer to stand out and be more attractive, you do them both in the same week. The downside is you're out $800 right away versus $400 first and then maybe $400 later if you're happy with the okay. inspection. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that is an option and that's something that's attractive to the seller because they find out right away within the first week or 10 days whether this deal's moving forward or not. Right. Many times a buyer or a lender will drag on the appraisal or not get it done until halfway through the closing period, and that, of course, is uh, uh, not something that a seller wants to deal with. Again. And by the way, that's also something that's attractive to listing agents, because the seller may be clueless as to when the appraisal is going to take place, what's going on with the appraisals right now. But I'm, if I'm a listing agent and I'm staring at an offer that says, 
We're going to do both the inspection and the appraisal, pay for those up front, and have it done within seven days. Now, you're not necessarily guaranteeing the results are going to be back in seven days. I just say appraisal to be completed within seven days, so that means it gets scheduled and they go out there. Then, yes, is it a little bit extra out of pocket for your client? Because what happens if you have a bad inspection? They're out 800 or 900 as opposed to 400, but for the extra 400, 450 bucks, it increases the chances of the listing agent accepting their offer because this could be a, a quicker process. We can find out whether this buyer's closing or not in a reasonable time frame. It's going to make your offer stand out. That I'll tell you, as, as a listing agent, I like that. I like that a lot. And just something you can do to cause your offer to stand out. No seller concessions. Uh, this means that we cannot ask the seller for help with closing costs. You've probably heard of that right, before. Yeah. 2008, 9, 10, 11. Buyers were getting concessions all the time, help with closing costs. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't, my rule of thumb on this is if you don't need it, don't ask for it. Okay. It will quickly put your offer to the bottom of the pile. Okay. okay. Next, proof of earnest money deposit and down payment. Now, here's the deal. The reality is we all have some buyers where they are like, listen, if I don't get help with seller concessions, then I can't buy. All right. So what you do in that situation, in this particular case, that wasn't the case. But if that was the case, and I'd say, okay, then number one, be prepared for us to lose out on a lot of properties. And number two, I'm going to recommend to the buyer that we only focus on homes, we try to focus on homes that have been on the market for at least a couple of weeks because those sellers are gonna be more open to the idea of paying seller's concessions versus somebody who just came on the market on a Thursday and you're submitting an offer on a Sunday, that listing agent and that seller is not gonna be very excited to see you asking for concessions. So they're going to stall, they're going to wait, they're going to tell you things like our seller doesn't want to pay concessions, you know, we think there's going to be multiple offer situations, and in a nice way they're telling you like, good luck with your buyer, we're not going to be even considering this offer. So instead, you prepare your buyer, we may have to sacrifice on a few things, you know, if, if you wanted a garage and a basement, we might only be able to choose one. You might only get a garage, or you might only get a basement if you're asking for concessions. We're going to have to go after some of the properties that have been on the market for more than a couple weeks. And that means one of your goals, if you have a list of five goals that you want in a house, might be sacrificed. But if that's what it takes to get a purchase in this market, that's what we're going to have to do. It's a simple one, and, and actually there's no risk to you, and it's just a little extra effort that can go a long way. What that is is basically saying, okay, here's our $6,000 earnest money deposit, and here's the twenty grand we're putting down on the house. And oh, by the way, here's a copy of a bank statement with $40,000 in it, or $30,000 in it, or $25,000 in it. Whatever it is, it's an amount that supports the, 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 the down payment and the earnest money. So what I said was provide proof, it got cut off there, provide proof of the EMD and down payment funds. So if they got a $5,000 EMD and they're putting 10% down on a $200,000 house, that's $25,000. With your offer, show them a bank statement or a letter from the bank that says this buyer has 25000 or more in their bank account and can cover the down payment in the EMD. Again, anything you can do to make your offer stand out, and that would definitely make it stand out. A lot of check that we're telling them we're going to get. It doesn't, I mean, other than making a call to your bank and saying, hey, can you get me this, or pulling up a recent statement, it doesn't take a lot of effort on your part, and it's really no risk. And it's just one more tool that we can put in front of a buyer or a seller's agent and say, hey, Here's proof of our EMDs. Here's proof of our down payment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's helpful. Yeah. Next is a personal letter from the buyer. Uh, and I have it written down here, relate to that. So when we tour a home, you're going to see certain things in a home that you absolutely love. You're going to see things that you absolutely hate. Uh, what we recommend our buyers do when they're submitting an offer, and that is, that is to write a letter directly to the seller. And you can put whatever you want in that letter, but we want it to, be, we want it to tug at their heartstrings. We want them to feel uh, a little bit of, a, of an emotional bond, right? It's not just a piece of paper that the offer is from. Here is the person or the family or whoever you know, the offer is from, and here's why they want their house so bad. And I try to tell our buyers, find something in the house that you're related to. Did you go to the same school? Did you see that they got something on the wall that you have? You know, just something that you can relate to okay. uh, to make sure you mention that letter. Okay. And when it comes time to do the offer consultation that we talked about, we have a, we have some sample letters for you, so okay. we'll make it easy on you. We can't write it by law; you have to write it. But I'll give you some good guidelines to go by and some samples from okay. the buyers. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, shorter timelines. So shorter timelines is good because 
Again, the seller wants, well, I said two things. They really want three things. The most money, highest odds of closing, and the fastest close. They want the money fast. So shorter timelines means um, instead of taking 10 days to do a home inspection, we get it done in five. Uh, or we do the home inspection and the appraisal in seven days, right? We shorten everything. Closing date, instead of putting 45 days out there, which is kind of the normal right now, we call Academy and say, hey, what are the chances we can close this in 25 days? Okay. You're clean as a whistle, we can close in 25 days. We're gonna put a closing date of 25 days. Okay. Seller gets their money faster. Okay. They're excited about that. Greater chance you're off it's accepted. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Little little things like that, right? So if they're looking at three offers and one has inspection done in 10 days, closing in 45, another seven days, closing in 35, if I can get on the phone with the lender and say, hey, can we get this, is this clean? Can we get this thing done in 30 days? Can I get the inspection and everything done in five? If you can shorten all those time frames, I'll tell you that's much more attractive to a listing agent because if this deal's gonna fall apart or if we're gonna have an inspection issue or appraisal issue, we're gonna find that out a lot faster than somebody who's wanting to take 10 days on an inspection or 45 or 50 days to close. This one here is a little tougher. Buyer knows the seller. By law, I cannot advise you to make contact with the seller in any way. I will tell you of some experiences that have worked out in our buyer's favor, and that is somehow the buyer found out who the seller was, found him on Facebook, they had mutual friends, reached out to the mutual friends, and it worked in our favor. There's been times where it's also backfired. So I can't encourage you to do that. I'm not gonna recommend you do that. Uh, I've had buyers literally go up to the seller's door, knock on their door, and introduce themselves. Okay. Um, it's helped and it's hurt. Now it has done more good than harm, but again, I can't recommend you do that. If by chance, as you're walking through a house or when you're getting ready to make an offer with us on a house, you realize you know the buyer somehow, do what you want with it, but I can't recommend you do that. Okay. Fair enough? Okay, okay good. Next, offer over asking price. That's a pretty basic one. <laughs> um, if, if the home is priced to sell, it's new on the market, very common that buyers are going in over asking. Okay. But as we talked about before, that really doesn't matter. It's really more about what you're willing to pay over appraised value right. because offering over asking makes no difference to the seller. The appraisal comes in love. Yeah. Um, if a home has been on the market for three, four, or five weeks, we don't necessarily have to offer over asking because the listing has probably become stale unless they just did a price reduction. Okay. Nonetheless, anytime you find a house that you like, that you're getting ready, that you want to make an offer on, I'm going to do as much research, much research as I can to find out if it's truly in a multiple offer situation, priced well. Now, one of the things that I could have said there that I didn't was uh, if it's been on the market three, four weeks and so forth, they might be a little bit flexible unless there was a recent price reduction. Now what I'm telling buyers and what I would have said if it came to mind is a price reduction is just like a new listing. It starts your days on market clock over. So if we, if you have a listing and you guys know for that list property, we have a listing at 425, it's been on the market for 60 days and you get it down to 399, you know you're gonna get a lot more traffic and you know it's probably gonna move quickly. Well, it's important when you're doing the buyer consultation to make sure they understand that it's not it hasn't been on the market 60 days. It was on the market for 55 days at 425, and it's been on the market for five days at 399. So we really have to look at this as a property that's been on the market for five days and treat it like a property that's been on the market for five days. Well, you know, I'm gonna to talk to the seller or the agent to find out what's most important to the seller, and at that point in time, we'll decide whether it makes sense to make an offer over asking, and I'll advise you that at that time. Okay. That's a very common one. Okay. Uh, cash buyer, obviously, if you're buying the house cash, that's something you can do to make your offer stand out. Cash is king. Mm -hmm. Generally, cash comes with no appraisal as well. We would literally strike out the appraisal clause if you're a cash buyer. Okay. Conventional financing, we already talked about that. Uh, you know, Conventional financing is stronger than FHA, and I understand you're doing conventional, so that's good. Uh, FHA is, is considered weaker because it has a reputation of more loopholes that the seller has to jump through. And really, in actuality, there isn't that much more, especially if you put the sellers responsible for zero cost. It's just the stigma, the reputation that it has. Sellers and seller's agents, unfortunately, will choose a conventional offer over an FHA any day of the week. Unless 
you know, zero dollars towards repairs, willing to pay over appraised value, um, shorter time frames, higher EMD, right? So FHA is not out of the question. These buyers can still get their offers approved, FHA, as long as everything else checks out good. Or if all the other offers have happened to be FHA, okay? In your price range that you're shopping, conventional is very common. Finally, last but not least, you have the option to waive the inspection. Again, not something that we recommend. Um, we see it from time to time. Comes down to how bad do you want the house and what kind of shape do you think the house is in. Now, of course, if we're walking through a 2014 built house, everything looks good. I mean, besides for going in the attic or checking behind, you know, checking the basement walls, you can assume pretty much everything's in good shape, okay? Uh, but we don't necessarily want you to waive your inspection and we recommend that you don't. It kind of goes back to that other one I explained. I don't want to call you and say, hey, Kelly, our offer was fantastic. Only problem is we lost to a buyer that said we don't need an inspection. Right. And then you say, well, Jenna, why did you tell me that was an option? Mm -hmm. It's an option, we just don't have to make it. Okay. Fair enough? Yep. Questions on this? No, I think you explained it very well. Good. So in a nutshell, I know it can be a little bit intimidating because it's a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of things in here that you're saying, well, geez, none of these are really working in my favor. Who is this Jeff working for, me or the seller? I'm working for you and I'm arming you with the information you need to acquire a home. Okay. Unfortunately, there are tons of buyers out there who will be our competition that don't have these conversations with their real estate agents mm -hmm. and they're looking at 10, 15, 20 houses, look, losing out on three, four, five, six offers because they're not doing any of this stuff. Okay. And so feel confident walking out of here knowing that you are armed with what it takes to acquire a home in today's market and we'll find you one within a reasonable time frame. Okay, sounds good. Fair enough? Fair enough. All right, I'm looking forward to going to work. Okay, so a couple things that I want to add there. You heard it again, okay? Sounds like I'm working for the seller. Really what I'm doing here is arming you with what is necessary to get an offer accepted in today's market. All right? A couple things I want to add to it, though, things that were kind of tossed around in the uh, one we did in Plymouth. Uh, and we've seen this in offers, too. The buyers paying the seller's title fees. All right, and I've already talked to Titleocity about this. They have no problem with this. If, if you do this in your offer, by the way, we've seen this in an, in an offer, and our seller loved it, and they accept the offer. It was one thing that caused the offer to stand out. So this, the, the buyer essentially pays for the seller's title fees, which is the, the title insurance and the closing fee. Now, Titleocity, if you get their sell side, and they handle both sides because they're already handling your buyer side, they won't charge a closing fee to the seller, which is now your buyer, right? So it'll actually only end up costing your buyer the title insurance, okay? So they won't charge a closing fee on top of the title insurance on the seller side if it's written up that your buyer is paying the seller's title costs. So in essence, the title costs that, that they'd be paying is the title insurance and um, the, the, the closing fee on the seller side would be waived. Of course, this is only if they're working with title Aussie. If the agent's like, well, no, we're using my title company. Hey, the buyer's paying for the title fees. The buyer can choose which title company, right? right. Another one we saw uh, was the your lender calling the listing agent, okay? When we get these calls from lenders, we like them. It causes their offer to stand out. And I know the guys here that we work with, I know they have no problem doing that. So ask them, hey, we're in a multiple offer situation. Um, would you mind putting a call into the listing agent just explaining that our buyer is strong and you've taken them through the pre-approval process? It takes the legwork off of the listing agent because a lot of good listing agents are going to call the lenders anyways. So if you're being proactive about it and you're having the lender call the listing agent, it's going to make your offer stand out. <clears throat> Here's another one. This is kind of a wild one, but somebody in Plymouth said they saw this on an offer. The buyer to pay the seller's moving expenses. Now, of course, you can cap it at $1,500 or $2,500 or whatever, the buyer's willing to pay for a moving company. Now, in a price range of like $50,000 to say $150, if they can afford to do it, I actually think that would really make the offer stand out because in a lot of those price ranges, the sellers aren't planning on hiring movers anyways. So it's kind of like a nice perk. It's kind of like, oh, that's cool. We don't have to worry about moving our stuff. We were going to have you know, all, all the friends and family over and order just a bunch of pizza and beer. But if they're going to, if they're going to provide a moving company, great. Um, I've, we talked about this in Plymouth. The inspection clause says we're only doing the inspection uh, for safety issues. 
We are not going to be asking for repairs. It's either going to be we're moving forward or we're not, and identifying that in advance. Now, I didn't eloquently word that for you. You'll have to think about how you could word that, but basically conveying that we're not going to be having an inspection so we can nitpick the house. We're going to tell you we're moving forward or we're not. Okay, and that's being written right into the purchase agreement. And then this did come up, and I know people are kind of like plus or minus on this, and this goes back to asking the listing agent, um, what is it that's important to your seller in an offer besides price and terms? And that is the escalation clause. Now, I'll tell you, your more traditional listing agents probably are not fans of escalation clauses. I'll speak on myself personally, uh, I, that gets kind of like set to the side. It still gets presented to the seller. But I'll tell you, I'm showing the seller, these guys put their best foot forward. So just be careful with escalation clauses, meaning the buyer's willing to pay $1,000 over your highest offer or whatever. Some agents, I've found kind of the, um, I don't know, it really just depends on the person of, of the actual agent. They're totally legal, they're totally acceptable. Some agents love them, listing agents. Some listing agents hate them. So before you do an offer with an escalation clause, I would just ask the listing agent, how do you or your seller feel about escalation clauses? They tell you they love them, talk to your buyer about doing an escalation clause. They tell you no way, just put your best foot forward, don't even think about doing an escalation clause. And you know we could go on for hours with stories of how it's helped you get a deal accepted, and maybe you never know whether it hurt you or not. I will tell you, with your more traditional listing agents that have been around for a while, they're probably, at least the circles that I run and the agents that I talk to, they're less excited about escalation clauses because it's kind of like cheating the system a little bit, right? It's like, no, put your best foot forward. And by the way, you'll have sellers. Your more traditional sellers will say, well, that's not fair. No, let, let's, let's go with this one, right? So find out from the listing agent whether they're excited about uh, escalation clauses or not. So there you have it. Offer consultation system, buyer consultation system, everything you need to do to arm your buyers to increase the chances of them getting their offers accepted. Questions? Or anything that you've seen that we didn't mention that got your offer accepted or your sellers were like, wow, this is crazy, this is great. How do you add all these uh, additions to your purchase agreement? Well, the goal is when I am sitting and doing the buyer consultation to educate them on all of the options and then when it comes time to write the offer, to maybe pick three to five that we really think are going to be standouts. And so it would go on to an addendum or we'd go into additional conditions on the purchase agreement. In most cases, you're not gonna have all of those 17 or 18. It's just gonna be two or three or four, um, but they're always going on additional conditions or on a separate addendum. You get 25. 25, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's very rare that it's gonna be all 25. Three to five is probably a reasonable amount. What other questions on the buying power checklist or what to do to make your offer stand out? We went real deep, hopefully we went real thorough. Now that the class is over, I can tell you that you can actually access this video publicly. So if you just search uh, Jeff Glover buying power presentation, this will come up. Uh, and you can rewatch it again or go back and get pointers or scripts or whatever you need from it. But I really wanted to not just present this, I really wanted you to understand the logic of why we do some of the things that we do. So hopefully you got a better understanding of that and you now are armed with a checklist that you can walk your buyers through during every single buyer consultation. When you do it during your buyer consultation, you will be amazed at how much easier it is to get them to do what you want them to do at time of offer. If you wait until time of offer to go over this, you're going to be less likely to get them to do some of these things. So make sure you do it up front. I know it seems like a long conversation. That was actually 28 minutes from start to finish. So this would be kind of like this, the majority of my buyer consultation, right? I'd have kind of an opening, I'd get into this, and I'd have a closing because they usually have more questions and next steps and all that. But really, I just wanted to focus on how to improve their buying power and chances of their offers getting accepted. So we are, uh, question? Yes. Yeah. With escalation clause, I've been out region too much. I, don't, I thought it was kind of counterproductive. But yep. if you were to use them, how are they enforceable? Because I think you have to show another offer to prove it that you had one. Yeah, it's so, yeah, it's my, it's my understanding, and Brent, maybe you can, if you go back and, so if you watch the Michigan Realtors Letter of the Law, multiple offer situations, they address that, uh, because I, I, normally when you see them, they'll say you must provide proof of the other offer, which makes sense, 
Uh, can they legally do that? Do you remember, Brent? You're not supposed to divulge because there's other there's information on that other which would be considered to be confidential. You know, uh -huh. so showing that other. So, I, and and I can't remember exactly how that was done, but there is a way that you could just like cross off information and then show them that. Um, I I gotta go with Jeff here on this escalation clauses. I don't, I don't I don't believe them either because it's yeah. just yeah. It's, it's just kind of just really much really hard to enforce, especially if there's a problem down the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd be careful with them. But again, and I don't want to get too, you know, into the the legal, you know, jargon on it. But if you go watch that video, there's all kinds of stuff on on what you can and can't do. All right, awesome. Well, thanks for your time. Hopefully, you guys will go out and get some more offers accepted, and uh, have a great summer. See you guys. Yep. <laughs>